Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Beyond the Cage Live right here on MMA World and MMA UK. As always, I am your host, Jim Graham. Joining me today will be Carrie Seller of In the Girls Corner and, of course, MMA UK and MMA World interviews and broadcasts as well. She will be joining me on this week's program as we are going to discuss UFC Belém, which happened this past weekend in Brazil on Fox Sports 1 for the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And once again, the Ultimate Fighting Championship has an event this weekend, UFC 221 on pay-per-view from Perth, Australia. The first event for the UFC coming from that city in Australia, featuring the main event for the interim middleweight championship of the world as Luke Rockhold, former middleweight champion, takes on former Olympic wrestling medalist Yoel Ribeiro in the main event. As I said, Kerry Seller will be joining me here on the broadcast. We're going to be discussing some mixed martial arts here on Beyond the Cage. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. And how you doing Hello. this afternoon, Kerry? Hello, hello. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. How am I coming in? Am I good? You're, yeah, you're coming in great. Fantastic. What's going on, Dan? Fun. Yeah, nothing much. Uh, I'm waiting for what's supposed to be Snowmageddon here in the uh, Detroit area. We're supposed to be getting starting tonight five to nine inches. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. That should be a lot of fun. Ah, uh, that's gotta suck a little bit. Like we were, we heard we were gonna get slammed, and we got three inches. Yeah, I think it was a couple. I think it was technically last year we got hit with something kind of big. But I think this will be the biggest so far of this winter season. And I'm like, I'm a little nervous because I'm like, man, I'm probably gonna get called into work or something. <laughs> I'm like, shoveling is shoveling, shoveling. You know, I I'm gonna probably have to do that regardless of the amount, but. I'm just like, man, if I got to go out, then I got to drive. So that's actually, it's worrying me is that they're going to call me into work. <laughs> yeah, you never know. You never know. But uh, I'm, I'll be pulling for you that you don't get called in. Right. <laughs> we'll see. But um, as I was telling everybody, of course, we're going to talk about UFC Belem, which happened this past weekend. We're obviously going to talk about UFC 221 coming up this weekend. Mm -hmm. But before I get to any of that, or before we get to any of that, Carrie, uh, there are a couple of things floating around there in the rumor sphere in mixed martial arts. The biggest one being concerning the next pay-per-view for the UFC, that being UFC 222. Of course, originally supposed to be Max Holloway against Frankie Edgar for the Fe featherweight championship. That was going to be the main event. Yeah. Actually, that was supposed to be the main event here in Detroit a few months ago before Frankie got injured. Yes. Now Max has got injured for, I believe, the first time in his career he's had to pull out of a fight. Due it to injury. So that yeah, it does happen, and um, it's unfortunate because this is a fight I think a lot of people have wanted to see Max versus Frankie for a very long time. Everyone. Once again, here. yeah, we are denied that. Hey, Jonathan. So it looked as though, all right, the easy fix is going to be Brian Ortega comes in, fights Frankie Yeager, probably for an interim title. Mm -hmm. Seemed like everyone was relatively happy with that. Then somehow that got kind of put on the back burner. Then we hear TJ versus Cody as a possible late replacement main event. Mm -hmm. uh, TJ Dillashaw pretty much outright dismisses that saying, I, this guy doesn't deserve a rematch. You know, I, the guy I really want is Mighty Mouse Johnson. I know. Cody tried, to really to go to men, tried to go to men. Didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. Um, and really, as much as I'd like to see that rematch carry, and I'll get your thoughts here in a second, I'm glad it didn't happen because this would be the third time in less than a year that this matchup between Cody and TJ have been promoted. And this is a matchup that's that's going to happen over the next couple of years. I don't want it so quick. So I actually kind of agree with TJ of not having this, especially in short notice, just like this. If this was the Provost main event all along, so be it. But I kind of like the fact uh, that we're not going to get that right now because I think Cody should fight someone else before fighting TJ or whoever is the bantamweight champion. Oh, yeah. It's not like it was a close decision or anything of that nature. Um you know, uh, 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 TJ picked him apart and uh, systematically, and uh, you know it was it was actually it was a really great fight in that respect, and an even greater fight for TJ Dillashaw. Um, and you know, I, it, it's it's kind of I feel a little similar about I would say you know a lot I know I don't a lot of people would say the same thing about Joanna, but Joanna was a dominant champion and you know held out battle for so long, so there that that's why they're giving her an immediate. Rematch, but you're right. They promoted the shit out of that fight. Uh, Cody, I think, should you know fight a con number one contender. And you know, I, I don't I don't know what happened to fighting for a title contention. Like, like kind of went out the window a couple of years ago. 
which is really a shame because that gives people, you know, a chance to, you know, instead of super fights and belts and intern belts, just fight for contention. You know what I mean? If, 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 if uh, champions hurt, you know, and has legitimate reasons, then I get the interim belt thing. But like, you know, I, I maybe make a super fight belt. I don't know. But I definitely, um, uh, I think that I, I, I respect that he wants to fight uh, D, DJ, Demetrius Johnson instead of Cody. And I think that's what I want to see. And I'd be really excited to see that. But I just also heard um, a Cyborg might be being put, wasn't it onto that card? Yes, that, that was my next thing. So it was going to look like Cody TJ for a moment. Now, all of a sudden, Cyborg, Chris Cyborg, has I, not, maybe not come out of the woodwork, but kind of. All of a sudden, she's going to take on, I think it's Yana. Oh, boy, I, I can't pronounce her last yep. name. It starts with a, uh, Is it like, not Kunetsov, that's a I, hockey player. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to butcher it. Her first name is Yana, and that's good enough. <laughs> yes, uh, she trains out of the Jackson Winkle John camp. She has fought for Invicta uh, for her last few fights. Yes has gained some notoriety, but I believe she's, correct me if I'm wrong, only like four or five and oh, she doesn't have a, a huge uh, record uh, underneath her. And I believe she's been primarily fighting at 135 as well. So this would be another girl from 135 who seemingly doesn't have the experience or the prestige to take on someone like Chris Cyborg, regardless of uh, her stature as champion. And also, again, you can say rushed. And I don't know if this is because Amanda Nunes, a fight with Amanda Nunes can't happen. A fight with Megan Anderson can't happen. I'm thinking maybe that's the reason why. And they're like, well, we can't give you the two fights you really want or really deserve. So here's this. And we need a main, and we need a main event. So let's just do it. <laughs> I, I think it's just kind of a, a rush thing. She said she was ready to go, and she'll fight like, anyone. So she'll, you know, yeah. she'll do it and save the card for them. And I agree. It, it just, you know, I, I'm, I, I just, I like that she's so active and she'll do it. I think that makes me happy. Um, it's, I feel like, unless they really start going for featherweights from everywhere, you know, just start pulling them from wherever you see a featherweight that's got, you know what I mean? Just do it because at the end of the day, that's who's going to stand a somewhat decent chance against Cyborg. Somewhat. Yeah. I mean, so far, no one has really proven that they can, can compete with her. And so for, from that standpoint, it's kind of like, all right, well, even though it's some random fighter, it's kind of like, all right, number, number one, number two, I'm going to be honest. I'm kind of glad we don't see another interim title with Max or I'm sorry, with Frankie and, and Brian, because Max, like I said, it does not have a history of injuries. It's not like Max got hurt again. We're like, Oh, well it's going to be a year till Max comes back. No, you know, yeah, that's not the case. it's an injury An injury is an injury and Frankie wants to fight. So I get it. So I, I like this main event from that standpoint. And we have our friend James Hamilton saying it could be another Shevchenko fiasco. Ah, uh, I, okay, well, I guess he means from the damage from this week I will get to. It could be. I don't know. We'll see. The, the cyborg we've seen is a lot more methodical. It'll probably end up being very similar to the Tanya Avenger fight. Yeah. Where she just kind of systematically Pick takes this girl out and puts her away in the third round. I definitely think she would toy with her more than anything with Holly Holmes. She knew that she was up against a very skilled opponent. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of people still – We'll say, oh, Holly Holmes, the bantamweight. Well, if you look at Holly Holmes' boxing history, she's fought at multiple weight classes. So, you know, it's and she's a big girl. She's a big featherweight. She's not. Right. I mean, she's a big bantamweight. She's not a tiny chick. So, and she's right. good at one forty-five. It's just you're talking about Chris fucking Cyborg that at the end of the right. day has a brown or black. I'm pretty sure it's brown belt. I've like done a lot of research and it's nowhere yes. black belt yet. Um, but she could destroy somebody on the ground if she wanted to and you know oh absolutely she's very skilled in brazilian jiu-jitsu obviously her former husband was a very accomplished brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt so um training with him for a number of years and, and now obviously training with uh you know tito ortiz and uh mr perella there uh in california i think has only enhanced her ground skills more suited for mma yeah so let's get her down <laughs> yeah tito was one of the first guys to really uh, I guess Mark Coleman and then Tito, as far as being effective striking from the guard. Yeah. Um, those two guys really kind of uh, established that as a viable offensive option in mixed martial arts. 
Um, so she's definitely learned from those two uh, gentlemen. But I, I, I like it because it's short notice. It's fine. I think if this would have been a main event announced for, I'm just throwing out this number. It's by no we means it was planned for this, but I believe there's that one coming up in Chicago, like 225. Mm -hmm. If they would announce like, oh, uh, Yana versus Cyborg 225, I think then everyone would have been like, really? You know, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people then would have questioned it. But on short notice, to kind of have a fill-in main event, I don't have too much of an issue for it. And that moves, uh, and now it will be Brian Ortega versus Frankie Edgar for the co-main event, which is great. It's not an interim. It still is a number one contender. And I like it because now Brian Ortega just doesn't have to sit on the sidelines and be inactive for, for six months because he's a young, exciting fighter. And I'm really glad to see him in there. And for Frankie, yeah, it sucks. It probably would have been potentially his last fight, win or lose. So now if he wants to fight for the title, he has to get through Brian Ortega. But um, that's just kind of how it works. And Frankie is a guy who's been injured before and has had opponents be injured. He knows how it works. But uh, I think this is a very, very exciting matchup. And I'm, I'm looking forward to Brian versus Frankie. I am too. Um, and I think if anybody could, um, you know, can can – because Brian, like you said, he's exciting, he's talented, he's well-rounded, uh, but so is Frankie, and Frankie's also got a fuck ton of experience. So, you know, you have a lot of things going for you with both of them, and I can't see it not being a really great fight, and Frankie loves to put on a show, so, uh, you know, it should be. And, and Ben Brian, too, he's a really, like you said, he's a talent, he's an up-and-comer, he's, a, I'd say, more than an up-and-coming at, at this point. His last couple of fights, he's just been... He's, he's a really good fighter, so I, 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 I can't see it not going anywhere, although I think it's going to be on, on their feet more. I think they're going to, you know, stay on their feet. And I'll, you mentioned uh, black belts earlier with Cyborg. Brian Ortega, obviously a black belt under Eddie Bravo in the 10th Planet system. Frankie Edgar just got his black belt under Ricardo Almeida, which is the Henson. That's why I'm saying it. They're so uh, well-rounded. It could go anywhere. There, too, so... Uh, we have two of the classic schools of jiu-jitsu, Gracie versus 10th Planet. If it comes to that on the ground, uh, not to mention Frankie's wrestling expertise as well, too. So anywhere the fight goes, it, it can be very entertaining. We had a question from our friend Brad saying, is this too early in his career? I would say no, because everyone was talking about after the Cub Swanson fight, Brian just fighting for the title. Yeah. So I don't think it's too deep a push uh, for Brian Ortega. No. I think you can make a case. I think it was last May when Frankie took on Yair Rodriguez that yeah. maybe it was too deep for I Yair. And that's proven. Yair has not fought since that beating. I mean, if that tells you anything, how, how thoroughly that's... Yair Rodriguez got beaten in that fight. That was last May, and we haven't heard any rumblings of Yair fighting anyone else, and now it's, it's a new year. So if that tells you anything. So I don't think it's too deep because the other alternative for Brian right now was to just sit and wait and possibly fight uh, the winner of Max Frankie in the summer anyway. Yeah. So that he was going to fight one of them anyway. Why not? Why not do it now when he's ready to go and coming off the biggest win of his career over Cub Swanson? Yeah, absolutely. I, I who would fight between Jim and Carrie? <laughs> Did you see my Carrie face? Or... I looked at that comment. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> probably Carrie right now. She has more training. I'm only I only got the one stripe on the white belt, so yeah, I see, don't know. <laughs> it's really funny because unfortunately, when 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 I was training uh, and when I started, I was also. A, I'd say a black belt in addiction. So uh, instead of, you know, taking my money that I had and doing the right thing with it and going and, you know, going to school, doing my homework, you know, and I'm talking about like going to BJJ school, going to uh, right. box and doing it legitimately, I would just, you know, like I'm not calling anybody out, but have my friends would teach me and, you know, I would take like classes here and I, I was, I was that kid. I, I was, I was an avid athlete. I just didn't like to do the work that came along with it. Like, so that's why I would get kicked off of teams in high school because I wouldn't come to practice. I'm like, fuck your practice. I don't need that shit. So unfortunately I can kick the shit out of a lot of people, but on paper, they'd be like, no, you can't oh, come and come and test me. <laughs> right. And, I got, and I'm a kickboxer. Uh, so I would definitely, right. how tall are you? How tall am I? I'm 5'10". Yeah, I could definitely right in the face. Kick you right. <laughs> I have 40 inches of legs. <laughs> I got our friend Greg. Greg is actually a, a fighter himself. Uh, he's saying everyone's a white belt when you get punched in the face on the ground. That's 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 thing. I've never done jujitsu with getting hit either. So that that would be that would change thing up as well. So Whole different ball game. Yeah, 
Um, let's see, we had a couple other questions here. Oh, we had a question from Aaron. He said, why is Loboff letting McGregor take all the attention when he would easily beat him? <laughs> I think that's a troll. That's funny. Um, I like that. No, Loboff would, in a real fight would probably stand no chance. The, the, I mean, the reach. What is, what is Loboff's reach? Like 65 inches? I think Connor's like 73 in just his movement. You know, it's, it's really incredible. <laughs> people, people don't take that into consideration. When you look at someone's height and look at their reach, that's what I really kind of yeah. take it. I really do. Because I'm like, all right, well, if they're not really tall, but they got like that length, it's, that's a scary yeah. motherfucker right there. You know what I mean? Yeah, Scarier Kevin, than Kevin somebody Lee, with like, length and height. Yeah, Kevin Lee's like that. I think he's my height, maybe an inch or two shorter, but he has like a 78 inch reach. Mine's only 72. And like, so that's like a, you know, he has a weird reach for his height. He's uh, uh not, you don't see too many people like that. Me, I'm five, yeah. five. And I don't know my, I'd, I'd have to have my reach measured. And uh, I know it's way longer than what, what I am. Cause it's supposed right. to be your body height is supposed to be your reach. If you go usually, the yeah. ball. and I'm inches off, like crazy inches to, to put that into perspective, I have 40 inches of legs and I've measured them. Right. So that's a big fucking leg on a five, five person. Coming yeah. At you. you know, I'm all like literally Absolutely. it's my whole height. <laughs> uh, then we had another question from James. Will Floyd step in the cage for real? No, <laughs> he lives Never. in Vegas. He took a trip to syndicate and was like, Hey, that's there. I'll, I'll take a step in it. But for real, no, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. Cause a lot of people have questioned that and asked me the same thing. Do I think it's really going to happen? And uh, I said, if it did, it, if this is this is legitimately, let's think about if it did, just just for one second, right. argument's sake, because you know a lot of people don't think about that, and I'm like, but wait, you never know, you never know, it could happen only because of WMEIMG, the whole Hollywood factor. I just could see it happening, right? So you have one right. of two things: you have a boxer going in there with little to no MMA experience, and you have a mixed martial artist uh, that is you know, some boxing, I guess. Um, and what do you think would happen? Would Connor try to outbox Floyd in the octagon or would he use his mixed martial arts and pick him apart and, you know, possibly submit him or, you know, cause he, that, that would be very easy. What would he do? So that's it. The, the fact that it could happen is there, but what would happen if it did? Right. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Peter. <laughs> look, wait, let me uh, see this. Look at my hands. I probably would. I mean, I probably smash <laughs> almost any guy that's in here right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have man uh, hands. They they're built for something, and it's fighting. <laughs> uh, all right. So we had another question, uh, comment from Brad, kind of following up on our. Um, he said Swanson is a different ball game to Frankie Edgar or Ortega has star potential, and it feels like it could be a short term game, but it would be a long term loss if he loses. Uh, I kind of see that, Brad, but I would say Brian Ortega is only 25 years old. He's only fought 13 times professionally. And if he loses to Frankie Edgar, which would be his first career loss, I wouldn't say it's a long-term loss for him because he No, be no. It's like that I said, would be a lesson. Yeah, because I would say, like I said, Frankie has one, two more fights left. So it's not like Frankie's this big hurdle that he's going to have to try to overcome for <laughs> the next five years. Max Holloway is going to be the big, big hurdle. And you can make a case of if he lost to Frankie Edgar, he probably wasn't going to beat Max Holloway. Yeah. So I think that that's where we're going to take it. And for a guy that is a jiu-jitsu guy like Brian Ortega, if he loses, I think he, he's a true martial artist. He will accept that, okay, it's not my time yet. I have to go back and learn why that didn't work. So I think for a guy coming from that sort of background and, and mentality, he seems like such a uh, – a great gentleman, a great guy to be around and what he's not only in his training, but he gives back to his community there in Los Angeles. Yeah. I think he'd be just fine even if he loses and even if it's a very one sided loss. Oh yeah, it's not I don't I don't think it will I, I actually I, I hate hate when people boil down uh, a fighter's loss to their career in general because I feel like it's just it is what it is. Everybody loses. You don't really there's very few fighters with a unblemished record in general, even Chris Cyborg has had a loss in Muay Thai and you know what I mean? So right. it's, you're never going to find a fighter with a clean record. It just, it's, it's just right. probably, probably pretty impossible. Um, but it's also like, like I said, things happen. So like how, you know, to, to boil them down to that and think that that, I mean, it, it could, look, 
you get like the Ronda Rousey factor where she allowed it to affect her career that greatly. She allowed right. it to make her fall into obscurity. And, you know, now she's back with the WWE thing, which is, you know, right. for her because now she's out of it, out, out of obscurity. Right. She, and she for, showed that that, didn't, that, that yeah. didn't hurt her stardom because right. she was very well received there. People were so excited. So yeah. it did not hurt her stardom at all. And if anything right. proves that, there you go. Right. Uh, and then John was saying, what fight are you more excited for? Can you elaborate on that, John? Like, yeah, what, on what like, card? I mean, this this weekend on the 222 card. John is a, Jonathan Paul Ruby is a very good friend of mine. John is throwing the Super Seminar with uh, that. that the oh, Super that's seminar. right. Yeah. With, that's um, right. And, and I know Jonathan. Oh, by the way, right what you were talking about in the comments for us uh, with the interview on Sunday live at one, because if you want – we could do it on uh, MMA UK or World, and everybody could jump in and out and stuff. And anyway, go on. No, no, absolutely. Um, and Brad was saying, I'm not pulling it down to one thing. I'm just saying. Oh, I'm not trying to. Real aspect. Look at Yair. I think Yair, the reason we haven't heard from him, and I did bring that up earlier, just because the beating was severe, I don't think it's because Yair doesn't want to fight anymore. But I do get what you're saying, Brad. I, You're, you're talking about bringing up a guy slowly. So I, I get your point. Some guys have been affected. Um, by that, but I don't feel Brian Ortega is that individual. You mentioned Ronda K Carey. Yeah, I think that's Brandon, the biggest. I think Brandon Vera was a guy that got some losses early that really affected him because he had that mindset where. And Joe Rogan talked about this podcast with Jimmy Smith. He was saying he was talking about two championships before he had one, and so Brian Ver Brandon Vera was a guy you can look at that just had the wrong mindset, and I think that's that's why. Whereas I think Brian Ortega. Uh, I said Brian Vera. Yeah. Brandon Vera. Brandon Vera. Is who I'm, a former UFC fighter, now 1FC uh, fighter. But I feel like Brian Ortega is a different guy, and I think he'll he'll be all right, win or lose. Absolutely. All right, let's get to UFC Belem, which was this past weekend. And there was a theme on this card, and the theme was the Brazilians were going to win no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, as the Brazilians were 7-1, and one, out of the eight matchups they were featured in, whether they were facing a fellow Brazilian or a person from another country. Yeah. Now, some of those were finishes, so I don't want to make it seem like everyone was, uh, you know, a decision. But the couple that were, some people didn't agree with. The two biggest probably being the Sergio Moraes-Tim Means fight. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people felt that Tim Means had the victory, and they even brought that up on the broadcast. The yeah. old announcer was kind of like, well, I think Tim Means might have won that one. <laughs> you know, kind of talking out of the side of their mouth, not trying to say it was, you know, hometown bias, which Paul Felder was like, I'm not saying it was hometown bias, but I'm not not saying it was hometown bias. He basically said, you know, and that's Paul, Fe that's a fellow fighter it who's happens. fought in Brazil. It happens you know? all the time. And then obviously we can make a case there might have been a little bit in the main event uh, as well, which maybe is the ultimate hometown bias, considering not only is he Brazilian, former champion, a legend in that country, he is from Belém, Brazil, yeah. like the ultimate yeah. hometown. So um, those were the only two fights I, I kind of think it was affected by. I think this is something the UFC, and this is not the first time this has happened, but uh, I think it's something they're going to have to take a look at because I feel like in America that doesn't really happen. Maybe someone can correct me wrong. Maybe someone no. can pull the record. But I feel like in an American versus Brazilian match, if there were eight on a card, in a card in America, we probably wouldn't see, to go into decision, we wouldn't see as, as big of a controversy. Maybe that's just me, but I, I feel like we see it more in Brazil than we do other countries. Um, I See, I don't Maybe that's I'd have to look up UFC Long Island. Uh, that's the way I would say you would, I would, you know, look at it like that, like a UFC Long Island or a New York card in general. Because you're going to get a lot of New York fighters, and Long Island right. happen to be a lot of you know you are New York general area fighters, right. and you can look Andrews, down yeah. the line at the decisions made on that card and figure it out from there. You know what I mean? That's how I look at things like that, and I don't remember exactly. I, I feel like there was a decision that I was like, that shouldn't have been, you know. But I don't know. I'm never. I'm never going to question it. Does it's 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 it is what it is. Uh, Maybe there should be some kind of unified rules. Like, like I mean, there is the unified rules, but, like, that everybody right. adopts finally, and it, that's it. We're all using them no matter what. But there should be a commission above the athletic commission, something. Somebody that's going, look, that's not at all how that fight was, and you can overturn it. Because if you could go back and watch a fight, 
and look at it systematically and be somebody that's like, you know, right. I, you know who's a really, uh, I, I, who, who teaches, I think, what is it, John McCarthy has, it's his, his course is the ABC. Yeah. His course is the ABC course. Yes, Dan Mergliata teaches it, and so does Kevin Mohol, or um, a bunch of people teach it, but it's, it's, I think it's Big John McCarthy's course in, itself, right? So Yeah, he's the first one I know popularizing it or making like a known thing, like a referee and a, a judge's uh, course. Well, maybe he could pick, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's the thing is there needs to be somebody that someone answers to. It can't just be an absolute in the hands of judges when obviously it could be a weighted decision. Right. And the reason I bring this up is because it could just be a stereotype. It could just be maybe this card reflected it more than others and it's affecting my perception it's something I have to actually go back and study or someone has to actually study. But I feel as though it's more of a recurring theme in Brazil than other destinations. Maybe that's just because they're able to load up the card with so many Brazilians that it, it makes it seem more of an advantage for them than other countries. Or maybe because we have so many American fighters that when they're on an American card, because our country is so big, we don't, we don't really think above of it because even though, you know, some fighters from California, they fought here in Michigan, we think, yeah, technically this is America, but we think of Michigan and California as two separate places that just happen to be in the same country more though united in a lot of cases. So um, I don't know. I just, I felt that way a little bit, but that I just wanted to bring that up and see, and see what you thought, Kerry. But getting to the fights itself, at least on the main card, first fight of the evening, did not disappoint. Two guys on a credible roll, both winning their last three fights by knockout. I said this one was going to buy, uh, end by knockout. Got the winner, or picked the. I actually did horrible on this card. I only got one fight right, so um, hopefully no one betted off my picks last week. It's the worst I've ever done in a while. <laughs> but Tiago Santos against Anthony Smith did not disappoint. Uh, Tiago Santos came out very aggressive like he normally does. Anthony Smith was doing his typical Lionheart uh, shtick, taking oh, yeah. the shot, yep. the back strong. Looked like he was going to get through it, which is what I thought was going to happen. He was going to get through it, get to the third, knock Tiago. However, couldn't quite recover um, enough there in that second round. Tiago put it on him, and that's a guy you have to put away because he has proven too many times he will come back and knock you out. So good on Tiago Santos. This is a very big win against a very tough competitor. And even though I know he was ranked coming into this fight, this kind of really, to me, reasserts himself in the top 15, not only with beating a guy like Anthony Smith, but now four wins in a row four wins by knockout. I think maybe he is starting to kind of get things together because he had a little bit of a rough patch when he had Musasi was in there. He had that bad loss to Eric Spicely. He has rebounded nicely from those uh, losses, and I think he's ready to make a, a push here to fight somebody in the top ten. Absolutely. A fight like that, you could definitely make an argument for that. I mean, that was, <laughs> I was watching that fight, too. I was really, really, really excited when I was watching. I was, it was so funny because I had to rewatch some – Sunday because I passed out on Saturday because I really wasn't feeling well. So I had to rewatch them Sunday, but I remember while I was like, you know, half watching it and half not watching it, I was like, holy shit, there was quite a few moments that like, I was oh, very, <laughs> yeah. very, very acutely alert, alert for, you know. Um, but yeah, you can make an argument for that. Santos versus David Branch, that very good matchup, obviously. David Branch, he's another black belt under Henzo Gracie. Um, I like, I like that. that uh, him taking on the, the kickboxing and Muay Thai skills of Tiago Santos, I think, would be an absolute uh, treat. And uh, Branch is obviously a guy that has, so far in his second tenure at the UFC has, eh, I don't know, he, he's looked all right. So <laughs> we'll see. That, that'd be a big test because he'd be facing somebody that will try to take his head off. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's not a lot of margin for error against a guy like uh, Tiago Santos. So I think that's a good fight. Um, thanks for the suggestion. Um, all right, next fight, Douglas Silva de Andrade, or as the announcer was calling him, De Silva. Um, yeah. The other play, uh -huh. guy with Paul, I forgot his name. He, he was messing me up the whole night. Um, I was like, it's Andrade, just call him Doug. Like, if you have a problem with the last name, call, call him by Doug. his first name. Call him Doug. You know, say the Brazilian, the guy in the yellow shorts, you know, <laughs> so, so many things. Uh, taking on Marlon Vera. I picked Marlon Vera in this fight because I thought he was the more experienced fighter in the octagon. Yeah. And I thought that his size at bantamweight would give him the advantage over uh, Dea Drodd, who's a guy that, while muscular, I'm not trying to say he's not, but more actually probably could be a flyweight. Mm -hmm. I, I think if he really could be a flyweight. So I thought, man, Marlon Vera is huge. 
think he should be able to, to get this job done. But Marlon Vera, I'm going to be honest, I didn't think he really showed up. I think he's taken on better guys in the octagon, and he's performed better. We've seen him perform better. And I don't know where he was on Saturday night. He, he seemed really tentative. Mm-hmm. He seemed slow. And it just seemed like for a guy that I would consider a striker, let a smaller and shorter guy able to control the distance – and just come right inside and throw bombs. And he had no answer for that. There was no takedown attempts. There was really no clinching. Um, there were some nice inside leg kicks he had, but they weren't thrown enough carry to really make a difference in this fight. And I think all around, Marlon Vera should be disappointed with his performance because I don't think he lived up to his potential on Saturday night. And I don't know if it was the lack of motivation. I don't know if he was hurt. I don't know if it was just De Silva. It was his night. I'm not sure, but... Vera has to really look at that performance and, and see what went wrong because it, it was not good. Well, it was not good. You know, nerves, and, and, and it speaks to, because I've had friends fight in Brazil and say it's very, not that they were nervous, but it's very overwhelming uh, how the crowd treats you, if, especially if you're not, you know, Brazilian and stuff. So that, that I mean, and, and for, the, for the fighter that is, you're fighting in front of a very excited crowd and they're very amped up, you know, I've, I've, been told it's very like palpable in there so there could be something to be said for that could be and it also could be now he is from originally from ecuador so fighting in brazil is probably about as close as he's yeah, going to get to he, at home yeah and so what i mean is fam- he probably had a lot of friends and family in attendance well that's what i'm saying it could have been overwhelming in that you know, respect family pressure. not in a bad yeah. way in a good way you know what i mean right that you're in as close to you either way either way as a person that's a, 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 from the home field that has it maybe experience that it's overwhelming you know you have how many people in attendance watching you that are there to want you know or if you're the bad guy and you're not who, right. who they want to win you know it's got a lot of people chanting your hate <laughs> yeah and it was a i mean dan Drage got the job done he was able to do that strategy pretty much the whole fight there was <laughs> nothing stopping him It's something that he's going to have to adjust against other talent because he can't just come in, chin up, throwing bombs as a shorter guy and expect that to work against everybody. It worked against Marlon Vera, but, you know, we talked about earlier some of the guys at the top of this division, like TJ Dillashaw and Cody Garbrandt. He would have got a countered hook and knocked out very quickly. I'm talking about Dean Drage. If he came with that strategy, he was one of those two gentlemen. Yeah. (laughs) So – Nice performance. <laughs> you got to keep your hands up if you want to get to the elite. That's all I'll say. All right. Uh, next fight here. Let's see. That was at heavyweight. Um, was a Tim Johnson fight. What can I say? It was the one Brazilian that lost, and this one would have been really hard to pick for the Brazilian. This would have been a very controversial decision if it went for the Brazilian, uh, Tim Johnson against Marcelo Gome. Mm -hmm. Because Johnson did what Johnson does. He gets in close. He grinds you, puts your back through that cheese grater. um, You know, showed a little more stand-up than we're used to seeing from Tim Johnson. But if you're not on your horse, if you're not moving around, if you're not actively in and out movement, this is what Tim Johnson will do to you. I think Gome was so confident that he would be able to move or he would be able to knock – Johnson out mm-hmm. I think he kind of underestimated Tim Johnson and that's kind of what Tim Johnson thrives on he thrives on you thinking that oh he's just this big old you know slow wrestler guy and oh and he you know here comes this young Brazilian that's really kind of lighter faster has like I think all six of his wins by knockout like ah oh, this this old you know big American guy he ain't gonna catch me I'm gonna run around this guy and I think he kind of underestimated him yeah and I think that really played in this fight Tim Johnson's a grinder he knows how to get wins and that's what he's going to do. It's no secret what he's going to do. Golem should not have been surprised by what Tim Johnson did in the octagon. And he, I think Golem kind of let him get that because he, he was he was too in his head that he was going to knock him out. And I think by the third round, Golem was tired because that weight started to carry on him up against the cage. And all that well, knockout power kind of showing the first went away. Well, I was going to say, once you're being smothered and you're up against the cage and again, somebody has good, good, good clinch work, like Brad, Brad was saying, you know, Tim, uh, it, when you have somebody that's able to do that and pressure you up like that and keep on pressuring you against the cage, it's, yeah, it's going to wear on you, you know? So, uh, and, 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 and like, like Brad said, hats off to Tim, great performance. And especially in, you know, not your hometown or your home field of it. Yeah. 
and, and this is the fight, you know, Golem's going to have to really learn because this is a fight where he had the skills to win. It was a matchup that was favorable for him. He was taking on a guy that was bigger and slower than him, that did not have as good a hands as him, yep. a guy he should have beat, and he didn't. So this is what he's, he's going to have to go back and learn a little more strategy and not just, I'm going to overpower everybody yeah. because – that's not how it works. You know, there are veterans in the sport. Tim Johnson is kind of like the John Fitch of the heavyweight division. This is what he can do to you. And if you let him get on to you, He's good. that's what's going to happen. The guy's a very good wrestler. He knows yeah. how to control people in those situations. So um, Tim Johnson gets the win. But, again, it wasn't exciting. It was a, t- it was a typical Tim Johnson uh, victory there. So but I, I got it wrong, though, because I thought the young guy was going to uh, get that one. But um, good on Tim. He employed his game plan. So – in the next fight, though, this was, to me, I think the most disappointing fight on the card for me because I thought Desmond Green was primed to make a big signature victory carry, and he did not show up. This was an awful performance by Desmond Green. I thought Desmond Green, with his wrestling ability, his speed, and let's not forget, also did make weight. Michelle Prezeris did not. Yeah. Uh, you know, would be the fresher guy, right? And we didn't see that. We saw a good first round where he went toe-to-toe with a very accomplished Brazilian mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu black belt, a very big individual at 155. Of course, Desmond Green has fought at 45 as well. And then in rounds two, he had an opportunity to, to stand up, didn't show it. He let a guy, I would say, is an inferior striker, get the better of him. Yep. And really kind of dominate him on the ground. I feel like Des Green kind of gave up about halfway through that second round. And that was very disappointing because I think he's a very skilled individual. This was his chance to really boost himself up in the lightweight rankings, and he just fell completely flat. Um, all the credit to now again, Prezeris did mace weight. That's going to have he's going to have to correct that if he wants to move up because this is not like his sixth win in a row. Yeah. But nobody's talking about Prezeris because he misses weight, so he's going to have to get that if he wants to be considered taken seriously at lightweight. Yeah. But for Desmond Green. Man, you know, I talked about uh, Marlon very er- earlier, but Desmond Green really has to look at what what was he doing in there because it just it didn't seem like he wanted to fight on Saturday. Like he, it just seemed like that was not what he wanted to do at that particular time. And you know what? It's really it's incredible, and it's like it's hard to watch when you see when you're watching somebody, and you're like, what? Like, like that's not them. What? That's not how they fight. Yep. What are they doing? And you know, it's really, it's a shame, but it comes down to what, what's going on with them at that moment. And I, none of us can really speculate, which is a shame, you know, uh, and, and, and all we could do is wonder what, you know, where, where was he in that moment? And, uh, you know, I do think that, um, um, I had even Mikel Perez is not, not, not making weight is, uh, that's like, come on, you know, it, 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 at this point, what are you going to do? Continue to not, well, if you can't, you move up. You do something. It's yeah, not, he's going to have to because it was six pounds, Carrie. It's not, not like, that's oh, not 157. That's not, I know. That's, <laughs> that's, it's, I was going to say, I thought it was four or five, but six pounds, that's not, that's pretty uh, crazy to miss it by six pounds. I'd say, well, you know, one and one and change, two, whatever, but six pounds is a lot of freaking weight, you know? And he knew that. Yeah, you um, know that going into the day of the fight. Come on. And how right. can you be healthy? That's crazy. Yeah. And Brad's talking about, according to Desmond, he broke the unofficial deal and turned up around 180 pounds. That has to have an effect on Desmond's mentality. That's what I'm saying. I mean. Yeah. Yes. Yes and no. Yes, because he knows the guy's going to be bigger. But no, because he still had an option to turn down the fight. No one was forcing Desmond Green to go in there with Michelle Prezeras after he missed weight by some time. We saw that in the co-main event. Yep. John Don. Uh, Pedro Munoz only missed by three or four pounds, and John Dodson's like, nah, I ain't having that. And that was a big deal for him. Yeah. Uh, John Dodson needed a win. Yeah. And he was like, you know what? I'm not risking that. But for Des Green, a guy only one fight in the UFC, he was looking more at the risk reward sort of the deal. Whereas John Dodson, you know, he ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Exactly. It's not going to, it's not going to, you know, could hinder him and not help for him. To right. It hurts Pedro Munoz, a young up and coming guy who hasn't fought for a world championship more than it hurts a guy who's fought twice and won an ultimate fighter. Yeah. So I think Desmond Green was looking at the risk reward. He's like, hey, if I beat Michelle Prezeras, that's a big deal in itself. If I beat him because he missed weight, that's even a bigger deal. Yeah. So I think he should have been stoked to, to fight and see this opportunity. But 
it did, like I said, it didn't happen, Brad. He just didn't show up. And I, I don't know if the weight was the cause of that, but you know, if here's the thing, he should have been moving faster, knowing that he had a bigger, slower guy there. They were always talking about that heat and humidity. You know that he's a guy that fades as the fights get in the third rounds. He's known for that. Yeah. And Desmond Green didn't do that. He yeah. didn't do things a lighter guy should be doing in a fight. So if it was weight, he could say that. But I, I just think that he just didn't show up. He just didn't, didn't it show up. Yeah. It happens. Let's get to what was the co-main event. Yeah. Valentina Shevchenko against Priscilla Kachera. Yep. I said that correctly? Yep. This may be the most dominant performance ever in UFC history. I mean, one of, like, at least in female fights, you can make a case it is. I mean, we're talking 234 to three total strikes yeah. difference. Yeah. I mean, everyone knows who watches my show. I'm a stats guy. That That's pretty good. Like, that's what, like, that, that's what you aim for. That's like... I know the new video game just came out, right? UFC 3, when you do that training mode and the guy doesn't really hit back and it just it just is basically a practicing dummy, that's that type of stats, carry. That's the practicing dummy in the UFC give video game w was like this. It was just so happens that it was uh, Priscilla. And I, when I was watching the fight in the first round, Shevchenko went for that, uh, uh, that Americana mm -hmm. in Mount. And I was almost kind of like, even if it's not pressure... Maybe she should just tap here. You know, I was really thinking, like, she should just tap there because she's not doing herself any favors. She obviously didn't tap. It went to the second round. The second round is like, maybe her corner should throw in the towel. Like, this is this is not good. Like, how can you in good conscience be a coach and friend of this woman and let her go out there for another five minutes? So I was questioning that. Then she got her in that crucifix, and I thought, oh, here comes the, the towel is going to come in. Right? I, I thought. We're How about the, the ref that was watching you know? extremely closely? Like nothing yeah. bad was going on, and this woman was yeah. not intelligently defending herself. Yeah. She was surviving at best. Now a yeah. lot of people, and, and Mario Yamasaki, to actually have the balls to come out and say, um, it, uh, what, 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 "What was his quote?" I was so like infuriated. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was like, oh, I think it was something like, died. I was right on top of it. You know, I was watching the whole thing and, you know, fighters get in bad spots and, no. you know, I let her try to work through it and then fighters get in it, bad it was something spots, to that extent. I know I'm paraphrasing. For, not for the better part of almost 10 minutes. You know what I mean? She was in a bad spot for like 10 minutes. Yeah, it Her was... face was not the same. Um, yeah. and, and you know what, and, and, and what was disgusting to me was that you have that Dana White, Dana White comes out and, and does his fucking speech, but completely foregoes the fact that Valentina systematically decimated this girl and did her job as a fighter. Right. That's what she's told. She goes in there. That's what no. she's supposed to it, do. Right? Yeah. It's the yeah. ref's job to protect. So he, he just wanted Dana White was just grandstanding. So if you really want to pick right. that fight apart. It, right. Mario Yamasaki is completely the person and, and her corner that failed to throw in the towel. Mario no, the Yamasaki corner. that failed to do his job as a referee because I'm about to take the referee course, the ABC course. And right. I, I believe it's the ref's discretion to get in there and say, she's not doing enough. I'm calling it. So, oh, you want to let the fighters fight, but this girl's getting demolished. Right. In your head is going, okay, that's not, it's not a problem. Yeah, it. I I think it's not all on Yamasaki, but Brad, as you brought up, some blame is on him. That's for sure, and I think some blame is on her coaches because, like I said, she could have tapped. There's a lot of people to blame. Yeah, and like I said, I, if I was being honest, if I was in a if I was in a fight like that, even if it was just submission, and this person's dominating me, and I even if there's not pressure, I feel that Americana get locked up. I would have just been like, you know what? You got me. Well, I'll do this another time, you know, or I'll go exactly. to the next, next guy exactly. to roll with or next girl to roll with. There were um, so many people to blame in this whole, <laughs> this whole situation. And it, it's, it's a shame. It really is. And it really does speak to the fact that they need to, there needs to be a, a, a precedence within that. Like they, okay. Everybody's going to be like, Oh, the, uh, the, the shit in your pants rule. The, the second right. that you defecate in the ring, <laughs> rules any, you lose any bowel movements, the ref can call the fight. That's right. been a rule from the beginning. If you can't right. hold it in because you're being choked almost unconsciously or you got fucking right. anything, 
They should call that right. fight. You should be knocked out. You can't continue. End of story, right? Right. To me, if you're in that kind of position and looking at the stats and lo- listening to the refs, that fight should have been called long, like within the first hundred and change, like 230 to three. Call it a yeah. fucking hundred. That is enough. That is a yeah. beating. That's a beat yeah. down. That girl didn't need 230 blows to the fucking no. head. Sorry. No, I don't it was. What anybody says I'm taking the rules course. I can I, I can confidently say that that is not something I would ever let fly if I was oh, a yeah. fucking ref at the moment. It was, well, I, I think it sure up Shevchenko's shot at the flyweight championship. Whenever he's gonna Nico fucking Mike. destroy Ready everybody in that division. If I was Nico, do you think she pulls a bisbang? Oh, I'm still injured. <laughs> Uh, I'd be afraid. Valentina's Valentina I mean, looked great. She looked so oh good in my, 125. She looked so good. My goodness. Uh, let's see. Is it is it justifiable to win? Here's the thing, though. This is not the first time Mario Yamasaki's name has been brought up I, with bad. Don't get me started. So that's why I don't. That's why I don't consider a witch hunt. It's not like, hey, you know, Mario's been good for 15 years. No, he's had questionable. He, he just made a bad call. He's been times. bad for about eight or nine of the last 15 years. Uh, especially when you add in, I brought up Kevin Lee earlier, the Kevin Lee, Michael Chiesa fight. We all remember that, right? I mean, so th- this is not. Do you think maybe that's why he did what he did? Maybe, but again, the submission came right there at the end. I think it doesn't matter. Submission, He's still, you know what I'm saying? Maybe, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't have uh, that but, shouldn't have infected him. But if you look but, uh, at him, but it may have, maybe subconsciously it did. Look at him as a referee, and look at what he does when he's refing. He's a ve- he's a big showboater. It's about him and the fight. He makes it very much about him from beginning to end with his little stupid heart. Like, okay, you're cool. Um, Mario <laughs> Yamasaki makes sure that people see and notice him. So he's a showboater. So I could see him going. Well, and now I gotta look good. Now yeah, well, that's fucking that, bad to a lot of people, guy. Like, yeah, but like I said, it, it's it's not a witch hunt if he has continually made oh, bad. Oh yeah, it would be a witch it, hunt. It's just time. Just mistake. this is the latest instance, yeah. and it's just so over glaring yeah. that it has to be adjusted. So yeah. here's the thing: Mario Yamasaki will still be a ref, regardless whether UFC wants him in their events or not. That that's the reality of the situation because there's enough. Uh, work to go around between his work in Brazil, the United States, and Canada, that promotions are still going to have him be a part of their event, regardless of the UFC. For, so for Yamasaki, again, a guy that's been refing um, not at quite as long as Big John, but a long time. He was one of, like, the first refs. He's been refing like, a bit. He's been around for a long game. For a bit. So, yeah. you know, he'll be all right, you know, if, if anyone's worried about that. Yeah. But it, it's one of those things where I, I think it's his time to start thinking of the next next career because he's just not doing his job as effectively as he should that's plain and simple and i think that's fair and i think mario uh hopefully would agree because if he doesn't agree then he's a crazy person do you know what i said (laughs) i love you i love you (laughs) right because at the end of the day i said there's you know uh fighters are criticized to the fucking unteenth degree you, everybody will pick a fucking fighter apart, but oh, don't say anything about the ref. Listen, it, 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 there is a point where, no, you shouldn't, but then there's a point where something like this, like you said, it's not like right. it's, if, it, if it was one thing, you don't pick the guy apart. If it's like, you know what I mean? You look at the person's history and Yamasaki is a fucking serial bad call maker. He is. It, and people get mad. He's a shitty fucking referee right now. He hasn't been, he hasn't been a good referee for a really long time. So right. with that being said, I would analyze putting him on a main event, putting him on a title fight, putting him on anything that's fucking important. Yeah. Uh, we had another comment from one of us saying the Kevin Lee stop, which is still the right one. The reason I disagree with that is because in a choke, you're not risking serious bodily harm, like getting punched in the face like Priscilla was. You get choked out. That's it. If you pass out, They wake you up, you're good. There's no long-term health effects to getting choked out. So that's why I disagree with the Yamasaki thing because Michael Chiesa was not going to get any more damage to his body if he let that go through and actually tap or pass out. So that's why I disagree. Armbar, 
different situation. Because oh, well, so a submission that's like, yeah, you're going to... I would kind of, you know, I, I would kind of um, err on a little more side of caution with that. But on a choke, no, I, I wouldn't at all. Especially a rear naked choke. It for me, it would depend on, like, let's say... Uh, wasn't the uh, Justine Kish choke going on for a minute? Like, in a, yeah, that is a different got, story to me. Yeah, to me, people got tough choke necks has been going on for a long time. That person is yeah. slowly losing oxygen. So at the end of the day, I would use my discretion again, looking right. at the time that this has been going on, and 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 then she's been in there for like no, cut it because you know what? I don't want somebody yeah. to get brain damage either. Yes. Some people have tough necks. I remember when Brian Ebersaw would fight Joe Rogan and be like, this guy has such a tough neck, you can't choke him out, that he would give it up so he could spin out and get position and let people tire their arms out. Mm -hmm. Some people just are, are very tough. Um, so that's why on chokes, you, you got to be careful jumping in like that. And that's why, again, that was... No, you got to use your discretion, but you have to really look at like a lot. Yeah. I would, I, you know what? I, I, I am taking that rap course because that'd be a really good fucking rap. All right, let's get to this main event where, again, I think there was a little hometown bias on. Eric Anders against Leo Machida. Now, Leo Machida did outstrike Eric Anders 66 to 46. So that is a fact. Yeah. I'm not disputing. Eric Anders did land three takedowns, zero for Machida, but he was only three of 11. However, I would say the more impactful strikes were coming from the man from Alabama. Yeah. I think that that's fair to say. I, I think the, the closest the fight was to ending – were strikes from Eric Anders. Um, I would have scored the first round for Eric, uh, for layout of Machida. I thought Anders then took two through two, th two, three, and four, and then I would have gave round five to Leoto. That's how I would have scored it with a forty-eight forty-seven victory for Eric Anders. Now, how the scoring came down: 46, 49, 46 in favor of Machida. That's insane. 48-47 for Anders and 48-47 for Machida for a split decision victory. And that's Tony Weeks. That's a veteran judge. That's a guy who has been around the game for a very long time. And I don't think either guy won four rounds. I, I don't see how you could give Anders four. And I really don't see how you could give Machida four. So I'm very surprised to see that score come down uh 49 46 that one really surprised me yeah that, uh, that kind of shocked me a little bit too yeah eric should be happy with his performance because he did what he needed to do he needed to not rush in i interviewed him he said he didn't want to be ryan bader thanks <laughs> you know rushing in getting caught with a counter he was very cognizant of it he held back the opportunities he saw to go forward he did he landed that left hand several times throughout the night. You could tell it affected Machida. It bloodied him up. He caught him with that elbow in the clinch, cut him open on the eye as well. The damage was coming from him. He sat back. He saw his opportunities. He mixed in a couple takedowns. Didn't have a huge amount of time on top overall from those takedowns, but they were there. He was threatening with them. Machida had some nice kicks. I think, again, his best round was probably the fifth. Yeah. That's where yeah, it's like round was really good. slow down For him, a little really bit, good. maybe – the 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 waiting game was starting to get to him a little bit because Eric is a guy that can throw a high volume. We've seen it before. So for him to only throw 94 strikes in five minutes, I'm sure if he goes back and looks, he's like, man, I wish I could have thrown more, but he couldn't. He couldn't throw more than that. Not yeah. really. Yeah. Not without, again, looking like Ryan Bader. So I thought he fought the game plan you needed to win to beat Leo Machida. I thought he did enough to do that. The judges disagreed with me on that. That's fine. I, I, what I hope Machida and Machida fans don't think this is some now second coming of Lyoto Machida because it's not, okay? He should have lost this fight. It, it wasn't a horrible performance. It wasn't as bad as his previous three getting finished, mm -hmm. but it's not like, oh, Machida's back. No, 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 no. <laughs> he's, he's not back because he's not taking the punches as well as he used to. He's not moving quite as fast as he used to. You know, a lot of the grappling exchanges that he would be kind of even with, he's losing to because guys are bigger and stronger than him. Case in point, Eric Anders, the big and strong dude. So, yeah, it was a win, but let's hope him and his coaches don't mistake this for something as a second coming and know that his time is coming. Yeah. His time to end yeah. his career, move on to the next stage of his career is there. And for Eric Anders, I think he's going to hold his head up high because he knows that he fought the fight he needed to fight. And I think that proved he's ready to hang with some of the best guys in this division. So I think for Eric Anders, even though the result wasn't what he wanted, 
there are a lot of positives for this, and I still think he is a very dangerous guy for anyone in this division. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a sh- I mean, it is what it is, and like you said, I wouldn't be upset about his performance. It's a shame that, uh, you know, the decision didn't go in his favor because I do think he definitely did enough to get the decision without a question. Um, you know, I mean, I, I love watching Leota fight just because of who he is and, and, and how long, you know, he's been in and his fight style is old Leoto. Um, uh, but, you know, when a fighter's time is coming, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, like you said, I definitely think I would have given the first round to him and the fifth round was without a question his best round. He, he looked really great in the fifth and it's just a little too late, you know. Uh, but, you know, there's that, like you said, the home field. I always say it, like, if you're fighting someone close to their backyard, good luck, you know, especially if it comes down to a decision because it's going to be – but, the, but it, it, yeah, it's bad. That was, that, was, that was a poor decision, but it is what it is. What are you going to do at this point? Uh, I, would, I don't think it's going to affect Andrews at all in the respect of, like, oh, they're not going to – no, he'll, he'll be moving forward. <laughs> All right, let's get to UFC 221. We're going to discuss the main card fights <laughs> and uh, pick the fights as well. So we'll try to go through this uh, quickly here. Um, looking over this card, it starts in the light heavyweight division. Tyson Pedro, he's going to be the hometown guy there from Australia, mm-hmm. fighting in Perth. Uh, this will be his third fight in, the, or sorry, fourth fight in the UFC, coming off his first loss, uh, not only in his career but in the organization. Back at UFC 215, losing to Alir Latifi. He's taking on Sarabek Sarov, who's 8-1 of his career. His lone uh, UFC fight was against uh, Gian Vellante on short notice, where, yeah, he had some uh, strikes there, but uh, nevertheless got put away uh, by Gian there in the second round. And this is very interesting to me because Sarov came in that fight short notice, a guy that's naturally a middleweight contender, so he moved up to obviously fight in the UFC and, you know, had a chance to take on someone like Gian Vellante. Now that fight coming in December of 2016. So it's been almost a year. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if he got hurt. Um, it was rumored. It said he had a fight scheduled against Rodrigo de Lima back in September of last year. It said it got canceled. So that mm-hmm. may have been an injury. Maybe he gained some weight. Maybe he doesn't feel confident at 185, but Taking on Tyson Pedro. Tyson Pedro is a huge man. Okay, <laughs> I'm like the uh, he's a monster, and yeah, I yeah I kind of regret his decision to to go back up to 205 because Gian's a solid 205er. Yeah, and he looked small against Gian. So how's he going to look against Tyson Pedro, who's a dude legitimately probably okay. should be a heavyweight and somehow makes 205? So I. Oh, man, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of almost feel bad for Sarah because I don't know if this was the right fight to take back after about a, what would that be, like a 14-month layoff? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I wouldn't take this fight on the way, especially in uh, in Perth. <laughs> I really would. Yeah, um, but, uh, Tyson Pedro. So many guy different that, things working against him, and I'm calling that Pedro is going to win that. Yeah, th- however, it's going to be exciting. If, if Sarah does what he did against Jean Vellante, where he's just – swinging and just taking hits well it'll be a fun it's gonna be a fun fight yeah exactly it's gonna be a fun fight but it'll win for pedro um yep yeah it it's yeah if we're giving our i know we're gonna do picks them but it's kind of hard to to stay (laughs) what's gonna i think it could be a rough night for the russian yeah um i'll just say that um let's get to the next fight at welterweight jake matthews against jin leon lee and this uh we got the leech love the leech um, has had some really good performances, uh, really as of late. I mean, he's won now, was that four fights in a row mm-hmm. with, uh, three of them coming by knockout. So he's not just leeching onto people and dragging them decision. Yeah. He's actually sucking the life out of them <laughs> and knocking them out. I mean, the, uh, especially his win over Bobby Nash. What a great <laughs> fight that was knocking out Bobby Nash. Uh, and then yeah. his last against Zach Otto, absolutely incredible. He's developed into a very well-rounded individual with good wrestling, good top game, now power. You know, this he's starting to become a, a scary individual. And um, he's taken on Jake Matthews, a guy that, you know, came up very good uh, at 155. You know, was able to get some, uh, you know, pretty nice victories. You know, he beat Luke Kumo, um, Deshaun Johnson. 
the one of the legends of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and Wagner Hosha. Yeah. He was actually able to choke him out. Yeah. That's a big deal. Um, you know, he had the loss there to, to James Vick, a fight he was winning but got caught. You know, he came back, beat a very good fighter in Johnny Case and Arkbad uh, Ariola. Then kind of hit some trouble. You know, he took on some some solid competitors. Obviously, Kevin Lee. No shame in losing to Kevin Lee. Um, had the loss there to Andrew Holbrook, a mm-hmm. fight where did not look very good against Andrew Holbrook. Uh, and that's when he decided to make the move to 170. And I think that was a good move. He was always a very young. I think he came into the Ultimate Firehouse like 18 years old. Yeah. Like 17, 18. He was, so he's, yeah. Growing up, you know. So by the time you know, I I'm think excited now he's for what, this. Yeah, he's 23. Yeah, he's 23 now. He's six foot. I think moving to welterweight was the right move. I think he was starting. I think that Andrew Holbrook showed that he was not at the same conditioning level he was accustomed to mm-hmm. just a few years later, uh, and he was able to take on uh, a fight where he didn't look that great in against Bohan uh, Vihalovic in his last fight. That's a fight he probably should have lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I hope he was able to take that as a learning experience because obviously that was his first fight at 170. He took on another really big dude. Bohan's a, a big 170. And I think he saw that the effort it takes to really try to grind someone out because that's what he was trying to do. And I think in this fight, he can't have that same strategy. He can't look like that against John Lang. He has to be moving around and get there because I, I think the wrestling advantage is with uh, the man from China. Yeah, And even though he's knocked some people out. I still think going on the feet is the, is the better area. Um, Matthews is probably, I would say more athletic than, than Lang. And I think faster being a former lightweight. Mm-hmm. So I think he has to use those things to his advantage and try not to, to do what he did against Bohan. Cause I think if he does that, he, he will lose this time and, and maybe get knocked out because he, he really put a lot of effort in that. And the way Lee has been fighting, mm-hmm. he'll, he'll catch him and knock him out if he fights like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, uh, that, that should make for a really, 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 really exciting matchup. And, uh, like you said, I've been like, watch, I've been like, liking watch Matthews come up. So, you know, it'll, uh, I don't know who I'm going to give it to. Are we doing picks? Did we say no? Yes. We'll do them at the end. Okay. Cause we'll do, them. do we have a time frame that we have to work with in here? We got, we got a few, we got a few more minutes. We try to keep it to hour. We're going to go a little over. That's okay. Okay. We got a lot of questions this week. So. Okay. Um, we'll keep, keep it to the end then. All right, let's go. Now, this is the fight. Forgive me for fans out there. I, I did as much research as I could, but I, I just haven't seen these guys really fight. So regardless of any research I do, I'm just, I can't pay it as good a picture as I just did on the last fight mm-hmm. as Tia Tuzava takes on Cyril Asker. Now, I believe, um... Tusova trains with Mark Hunt there in Australia and New Zealand. He's one of Mark Hunt's main training partners. Okay. So obviously this is a very tough dude. Yeah. Um, if, he's, if he's training and taking punches with Mark Hunt. Uh, absolutely. He's 8-0 so far in his career. He's a young dude, 24 years old. Um, this will be his second fight in the UFC, his first fight. He knocked out Rashad Coulter with a knee. In the very first round, Mm -hmm. he also owns a win over James Sweeney, who used to be in the UFC. So this guy's taken on um, some decent competition even outside of the organization. And his only loss, this is according to Tapology, in recent memory was losing to Ismail Lazar, Mm -hmm. who's a very accomplished kickboxer. So that's not a bad loss. Uh, Lazar actually fought Rico Verhoeven for the Glory Heavyweight Championship. So... Not a bad dude to take out, uh, to take on, first of all, and, and lose. So um, I give him credit for, for going to the ring against that guy. But um, this is going to be a, a kind of like Mark Hunt Jr. Um, <laughs> his name's Bam Bam. That's his nickname. And Surreal Asker uh, coming into this fight, uh, 32 years old out of France. He has an impressive record as well. He is 9-3 and three so far in his career. Uh, wow, he's fought this many times in the UFC? I would have never have guessed. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's... Fought four times yep. in the UFC, two and two. Most recently defeated Yao Zong Hu, yep. if I said that correctly, uh, submitting him in the second round. He's also fought the likes of Jared Cannonier and Walt Harris, getting knocked out by both those individuals. Yep. And also does a knockout win over Dmitry Smolyakov, mm-hmm. if I said that correctly. Um, he actually fought three times last year. So good on him. That's a pretty active guy. However, with seeing losing to two big, strong powerful strikers and Jared Cannonier yeah. and Walt Harris, 
that might fall right into the hands of the Australian Mr. Absolutely. Bam Bam. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but what do you think about this matchup, Carrie? Um, you know, again, I don't know too much about either of them. Uh, but, you know, looking at their stats and, you know, looking at their history, um, I don't know, man. I, I Australia, whenever you see a fight there, it's uh, it's kind of fun. So you got it's it's pretty much like we're gonna see another like Brazil, you know, where it was Brazil against everyone. This is Australia against the world right now. Um, and Australian cars are almost always exciting. They're, I think, I don't know if they have the record, but I remember the last like three or four cards in Australia. The majority usually ends up being finishes. I don't know why it's always, that it's, is. That's what I'm saying. It's never been. It, it's been, just I don't know. They've been good cards, it so I can't see it being a bad card to say the least. Um, those cards, I I remember. Oh, what was the last one that was decision and everybody got all pissy about it? Um, like is it the Damian Brown fight against no, Camacho? Uh, 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 um, uh, I can't remember her name off the top of my fucking head. Oh, the Beck, uh, Beck Rollins, Jesse Jess fight? One before that. Not oh, she took on the, um, was that the Korean girl she took on? It wasn't Beck, Beck it was the other chick. I can't remember her name at the moment. Why can't I remember her name? Ah. Uh, anyway, uh, I can't remember her name at the moment. It was one of the last cards, and I believe it was in Australia, and the decision went the other way, and people were pretty pissed about it. I can't remember who it was. It's off the top oh. of my head, I can't. All right, well, that one should be fun because, like I said, I, I, I've, I've heard about, uh, I believe it's Tia, and, you know, he's, him training with Mark Hunt. So the fact he's fighting on the same card as his kind of mentor and coach. Right before training, him. I th yeah, and, and right before him. So, and obviously Mark Hunt only has a few more fights left in his, his career as well. So I know he wants to do him proud. So, and obviously fighting in his home country as well, do his country proud. But yep. uh, you see a little bit of a coming out party for him in that fight. But, you know, looking at his coach and mentor, Mark Hunt, he's taking on Another young guy in the heavyweight division, Curtis Blades. Yep. This is a guy who actually started his UFC career taking on Francis Ngannou on short notice. Now, he lost that fight, but since then, I think has really developed into a very competent heavyweight, winning uh, three his next three straight fights. Now, sure, there was an injury to Olenek, but let's be honest, he was dominating Alexei Olenek. Yeah. Um, he made Alexei look all 40 years old that he is. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very dominant performance. And the fight before that was also a very dominant performance against uh, Daniel Olmanchuk. Yes. Um, now, the only criticism I had of him in that fight was he was piecing him up on the feet, but kept on trying to take him down. And I was mm -hmm. like, what is he doing? Yeah. Just knock him out, man. Yeah, if you have, so, if you have I, the opportunity, think, you can do, yeah. it, do it. And I think he learned from that fight, because in the Olenek fight, a guy that is a extremely good submission grappler. I mean, we're talking about a dude that has, like, I think five or six no-gi MMA Ezekiel chokes. Mm -hmm. Those are very difficult to pull off. Oh, yeah. So, not a dude you want to mess with on the ground. This dude is called the boa constrictor for a reason. And he pieced him up. And, of course, there was some controversy in that fight because there was, like, a stoppage. There was, like, a kick that was laid and all this and that. Um, but the correct decision was ultimately made that it was a knockout yep. and a victory and not an illegal disqualification or whatever. So I'm glad that got taken care of because um, the, the right decision was made and Olenek admitted that, yeah, I, I'm not going to continue. <laughs> that, so I'm glad that that got turned around for Curtis because that, that was a signature win for him. And I think he's ready for the next stage. And this is his opportunity to do so. Yeah. He has to do exactly what he did against Alexi. He has to keep on the outside, throw those big, powerful kicks, and do not let the much shorter uh, Mark Hunt inside to land one of his devastating punches that he walks away from. The walk-off. The knockout and walk-off. I like it. <laughs> I'm a fan of both of them. I actually really do like Curtis Blaze a lot. Um, a lot, a lot, and I love Mark Hunt, so I am not even going to make any kind of call on that fight. Yeah, Mark Hunt, he got, he has his work cut out for him. I know, Curtis I'm not calling on that fight. I'm is, not even making a pick. I love both of them. I just want to mention this. He's six foot four 
with an 82 and a half inch reach. Yeah. Okay. Mark Hunt is, I believe, my height at 5'10, which is ridiculous in itself that he fights a heavyweight if you want and to think he about that. Easily um, in there and uh, do it has a damage. reach of 72. Yeah. So imagine if I weighed 300 pounds. That would that's Mark Hunt yeah. fighting a heavyweight. Yeah. And I can't imagine, first of all, weighing 300 pounds. <laughs> I'd, I'd about to double my body weight. Uh, and then taking on monsters like that. Yeah. So Mark Hunt is definitely a, a warrior, and he's 43 years old. I know. Let's not forget. I know. He's he hasn't. Uh, he's fighting his home country again. He has done well there, but yeah, man, he has his work out. He does. Because this, Curtis Blades this, is a beast. You know what? Neither of them should yeah. be upset with whatever the outcome of this. I don't think it's no. going to go all three rounds at all. Uh, I don't think it's going to go to decision whatsoever. And I know. And I know Mark was saying, oh, I should be taking on someone, you know, more high esteemed and, and this and that. But Curtis Blades is legit. I was going like, to say, this I, wouldn't, if I, was I dude. wouldn't say that. I wouldn't sleep on that at all. Yeah, I, I think that I hope Mark Hunt doesn't underestimate Curtis Blades because yeah. if he does, he's going to get hurt. I, like that. That's real. This guy is legit. I agree. All right, main event of the evening, Luke Rockhold against Yoel Romero. Of course, Raw disappointed to not see Luke versus Robert Whitaker, but I think this is a very apt replacement, interim title or not. Very excited for this fight. This is a fight that obviously could have really happened anywhere in the last about four or five years, uh, but we get to see it now. And I'm super excited because we have a guy that is one of the best wrestlers ever to compete in mixed martial arts, as I did my opening little preamble there, won an Olympic silver medal. He's one of the few guys ever in any form of wrestling to beat the great Kale Sanderson, mm -hmm. uh, former Iowa State wrestler, Olympic medalist himself, and now obviously a guy winning uh, national championships coaching the Penn State Nittany Lions in their wrestling program. So this is a guy that's an absolute monster, despite being 39 years old, is in maybe as good a physical shape as anyone in any weight class. I mean, this guy's just a monster. Mm -hmm. And he takes on Luke Rockhold, a guy who's he's big, he's tall, he's fast, he's a great striker. You do not want him on top of you. A guy that's also a very competent submission guy. I mean, look at remember his submission of Tim Bosch with how he moved with that Kimura. He submitted Leota Machida. Um, he pretty much beat the brakes off of Chris Weidman. I mean, <laughs> this guy's very, very good. Um it's a very intriguing fight because I think if it stays standing, you would think Luke Rockhold would be able to keep things at enough distance to not allow the reckless power of Romero to get to him. You also think that because he's such, even though he's not, maybe it's physically like jacked, he's so long and lanky. Yeah. He can use leverage to keep the better wrestler in Romero off of him. But Romero just has that X factor of just doing things you don't expect. And he does them freakishly fast. He does them freakishly strong, and it can take you from a position where you think you have the advantage to then you don't, and you're knocked out. Because if we go back to his fight against Chris Weidman, Chris Weidman was probably winning that fight. I, I think Chris Weidman was winning that fight, heading into the third round. Then all of a sudden, the yeah, knee but... uh, from Havana <laughs> you know, knocked him out. So that's the type of things he can do that other people just can't do at, at this division. That's always an X factor when you face him. Yeah, but what about his last fight? Take Romero's? that into consideration. He, I, in his last fight, didn't he fight Whitaker? Yes. He looked like he, shit in the fourth and fifth round. He that's that's like the X factor, too. He doesn't, he doesn't quite have the conditioning. I personally think, just my personal opinion, if Brock Hole could get him out of the third, he's got it. At, well, would you think it'd be better for Rockhold to try to get this into the fourth or fifth, knowing that Romero has to pace himself to go? Oh, I, I, I personally would go for I would go for a smart technical, you know, wear him down, beat him down, get him to tire out, and execute. Personal opinion: If 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 Yoel, and we've seen him very, you know, powerful and devastating. So it's not if; it's a matter of that he is and he can. Right. Um, and he is so powerful, and he does have that, you know, where he'll do some freak things. Uh, Yoel's a very scary guy. So seeing in his last fight, and it's to improve your conditioning, it's it's not easy. You know what I mean? Like, I, I if I was him, I would have a very smart game plan in that respect. Absolutely. Right. Like, how how much did it improve in, in seven months? It, that's what I was going to say. It, Right. Your conditioning, it takes a lot to improve. You, that's something you got to work on, like, every day. And is he working on that? You know what I mean? Because there's other things you right. got to work on. Right, so. and also he's 39. 
I would it's definitely, not, I would, I would take him. I would, I would wear him down if I was Luke. And I, I honestly am saying a rock hold win. Right. I think that's what he had. Again, he has to use that height and reach to create leverage to not, to not get taken down. Because if he, he gets taken down, we, as much as I think Luke Rockhold is dangerous on top, Yo Romero is definitely a guy you don't want on top of you. Mm-hmm. That's 100%. Yeah. So he, that's the key. He has to stop the takedown, keep his distance, throw those leg kicks, throw some push kicks, light, light jab touches, yeah. get him, him into out. the fourth. He, yep. he has to pace himself. There, and as incredible as that performance was by Robert Whitaker, Romero still had to pace himself. He still had a chance to win the fight. As much as I think Robert Whitaker had a great championship performance, which he did, Romero was still in that fight. You know, he still had a chance to become the middleweight champion. He the world. did. He was able to do so. But because he had to pace himself, he wasn't as effective as he is in a three-round fight. No, he was and not so, effective in that respect at all. And I think and that's, that's something that Rockhold. Luke Rockhold has to be cognizant of because if he gets caught up in trying to match takedown for takedown or match strike for strike and get kind of an ego you know, about him, which Luke has done. Luke has gotten an ego before. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, then that plays right into the hands of Yoel Romero. Luke has to try to take some ego out of this fight. Yeah. Um, because that could get him in trouble. And I think that's one of the reasons why he got caught with Michael Bisbing that, that time. I yeah. think he got caught up in his own head a little bit. Because Bisbing's not a guy that usually first-round knockout people. <laughs> I thought <laughs> so, that that was going to happen, too. I just you know, I was just like, ah, I'm feeling a big Bisbing win tonight. Like, yeah. It happens. All right, let's get to picks here. UFC 221 uh, coming this week out on pay-per-view from Perth, Australia. Ten in the east, seven in the west. First fight of the evening coming in at light heavyweight Tyson Pedro against Sarabak Sarov. We're going with Tyson Pedro. Like I said, I think we kind of gave our pick, picks yep. away, Kerry. But uh, good luck trying to take on this this very large gentleman. Yep. All right, uh, Jake Matthews versus John Liang Lee at welterweight. I really like Jake Matthews. I'm a big fan of his. But Lee, the leech, he's the man on the roll right now. I go. You typically go with the, the man or woman on the roll. Going to go with the man from China in the leech uh, to win this one. Uh, uh, we're going to battle. I'm going with the Celtic kid. <laughs> Uh, we got Tua Tiavasa against Surreal Asker in the next fight in the heavyweight division. Going with uh, Mr. Bam Bam there, uh, Tuyasa, to win this one. Uh, I'm going with uh, Silverback France. I'm going with uh, Asker. Okay. All right. Co main event of the evening Mark Hunt against Curtis Blades at heavyweight. I'm going to go Curtis Blades. Uh, he's the young, hungry guy. I, I think Mark Hunt, again, always has a puncher's chance, but I think Curtis Blades is going to be able to either strike with him or take him down and use his, his wrestling skills, as Mark Hunt has been out-wrestled uh, very recently. You know, Stipe Miocic um, out-wrestled him. Uh, shoot, who was the other guy? Um, why is the name escaping me? It was recently. I don't know. But he's gotten out-wrestled before in the last couple of fights, so I'm going to go with Curtis Blades in this one. Oh man, I, it's this is crazy because as much as I, I don't know because I like my heart's like pulled in two different directions. So I that's why my mind is like ah. But uh, you know what? My brain is telling me that Mark Hunt is gonna shock the shit out of everybody, and uh, I think he's gonna knock out Curtis Blades and uh, show everybody that he's got you know another fight or two left in him. Just cool on it. All right. Main event of the evening, interim middleweight championship on the line, Luke Rockhold against Yoel Romero. Man, this is a very tough one to pick. I'm going to go Luke Rockhold in this one. I just think his stand-up skills are going to be a huge difference in this fight, factored with his conditioning. So I'm going to go with Luke Rockhold in this one. Make that too, definitely. Uh, I don't – I. I think it's it's going to be multiple reasons, but uh, I'm definitely seeing Rockhold winning that, and uh, I'm excited for that. Not that I wouldn't want to see UL win. I just think that uh, Rockhold's going to uh, – I'm really hoping that he his fight IQ is in there with him, you know? I think he's fighting a really smart fight because he does have the chance to, you know, weather that storm if he does it right. 
Absolutely. All right. She is Carrie Stellar. Carrie, anything you want to plug? Uh, tell people where to follow you at Twitter and all that good social media stuff. You can follow me uh, at Carrie Stellar on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and uh, in the Girls Corner. You can also follow me in the Girls Corner on uh, Instagram uh, and then on uh, Twitter, Stellar79 and ITGC blog. That's, I'm everywhere. Of course, I'm your host, Jim Graham. If I'm on Twitter, just my name, at Jim Graham. And of course, thank you again for watching on MMA World. Please like our Facebook page and our uh, sister page, MMA UK. Uh, also on Twitter, at we are MMA UK, Instagram as well, and then MMA World on Facebook and Instagram as well. Please follow all those accounts to stay up to date uh, on the latest and greatest breaking news in the world of mixed martial arts. And it's MMA World with two Ds at the end. That on is Instagram. correct. That is correct. Uh, and I think it's... Yeah, same same thing on Twitter and Facebook as well. So it's MMA World with yeah two extra Ds at the yep. end. So yep. All right. So for Killer Seller, I am Jim Graham. Thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.